right. area. So Roberta had taken a walk over to this area where there was a view of a golf course. And at the time, this um, Mount St. Joseph's was fairly rural. You had the convent and then there was kind of like a golf course area, but it wasn't very developed yet. Right. So it still was, was pretty rural and secluded. Well, she goes over to this, you know, nice area. There's this beautiful view of this golf course. You know, she's she's praying. She's meditating. Around mid-morning, maybe about 10.30 a.m., she stops by the kitchen for a snack. From what I understand, she gets an apple. It's the last time she would be seen alive. And this was June 13th, 1977. So she's been living in Virginia about a year. You know, she's getting closer to taking those vows. She decides she's going to go do this meditation. Well, that's a big decision. She's hanging out. And for someone who's very, you know what I mean? I grabs mean, a snack. She's going to then take a walk and go do some more meditation. You know, because she's, she's got to think about this. Her life as a nun, you know, that's, there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with that. And you're, you know, making a lot of sacrifices. You're giving up all that other good stuff. People called her Sister Robin, by the way, even though her name was Roberta. That was her nickname. And she had spent the previous year... As I mentioned, she'd been in West Virginia for about a year. She'd been working in this adult religious programs as a coordinator for the Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston area, kind of throughout the state of West Virginia. So she was kind of going around, you know, teaching these kind of adult religious programs. I mean, kind of like a Sunday school or something almost. Okay. Kind of doing her uh, outreach, you know, in these rural communities trying to bring people into the Catholic Church, that kind of thing. Do- indoctrinating the yeah. people's children like a good church. So she's out meditating. I just thought I'd throw that in there, let you have a little background about her. Well, the bench where she was likely sitting, doing her meditation, was knocked over. She had been dragged by her throat, raped, and then strangled to death, basically just being left there to die. Oh, God. There was a groundskeeper that found her body partially clothed about three hours after the crime was committed. So they determined, you know, and of course, medical exams back in the 70s were not like they are today. Yeah, I mean, they're probably now heavily they visual. Definitely pinpoint and today, of, yeah, you know, hey, right. this person probably died at 9.37 a.m. Well, that's not to say <laughs> back then they didn't have very talented, you know, medical examiners and people that were very, very good. Well, they determined that from what the evidence suggested that she had been killed pretty quickly after that 10.30 a.m., like when she'd stopped by, grabbed a snack, went back out to meditate. I bet it was the food, bro. Someone grabbed... In her stomach. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. They could tell how long it digested. Someone, you know, had obviously committed this crime within a short period. She had these bruises on her neck, on her legs. They think she, you know, maybe had been discovered about three hours after. This is like early afternoon that he finds her body. What the hell? Her clothes were dirty because she'd been dragged on the ground. And the weird thing is the murder took place less than a 100 yards from the sister's retreat house and just adjacent to the Mount St. Joseph mother house because she was staying in like the retreat house where other women would come stay for the meditation and for the right kind of the support each other kind of and stuff. all that. Yeah. And then the mother house was where the actual like sisters who oh, lived mother the, superior like were they were the sisters who lived in the convent it was like actually their house oh, it's a habit from what i understand you know yeah investigators were trying to find links between the rape and murder and there was a series of rapes and murders in washington county pennsylvania so they were trying to link these together because they thought there could possibly be this serial rapist slash serial killer who was in the area because there were these four other women who were murdered in Pennsylvania, which I guess Washington County was not that far away. I mean, it was within, I think, right. enough distance. It was close enough that they thought this could possibly be this same person driving yeah, probably doing this. 35, 50, 60 miles apart, maybe, you know, right. or less. But the knows? thing is, the area was really secluded. So the thought that the serial rapist and murderer in Pennsylvania would just randomly drive to okay. this area in West Virginia. So that has to be a local? I mean, they were just I mean, like, that... well, they were trying to find the links to this killer. They couldn't. Then they start to kind of 
you know, I guess sort of dissolve that theory because they're like, well, it's a really secluded area. It's not the kind of place that someone's randomly, randomly probably just going right. to go. It's not right off the road. It's or... kind of out. Yeah. I mean, right. people know there's like a convent of nuns and a golf course and that's pretty much it like out in this area. And it was so secluded that there wasn't really a chance for anyone to hear the screams or cries for help because it was so secluded. Yet it was only a hundred yards away from these houses where the nuns were staying. Yeah, but nuns would probably be quiet. You know what I'm saying? They probably ain't even allowed to open the windows and shit. They're all up in the house, you know, meditating and chanting and stuff. Right. So they well, ain't hear nothing. well, with it being that quiet, don't you think if someone was screaming that they would hear that? God won't let them open the windows. People, let's pray to get God to change his okay, mind. Okay, just that. stop. <laughs> I'm, just, uh, okay. I'm sorry. I love I love nuns. He is mill. They ain't open the fucking window. I'm telling he you. He's mill crazy. They want it to be stuffy. Okay, baby. Well, of the interviews conducted, police talked to a drifter who was trying to hop a train. I guess in the area. Okay. And you reckon they saw him like phys- actually trying to do it and like, hey, hey, buddy. Well, I mean, I guess they knew he was in the area and he was trying to hop a train. I don't know. God, you're so literal. Members of a Georgia-based salvage crew were also working in that area on some telephone poles, telephone lines. Okay. They were investigated. Now, there was a sketch that was released of a man in his 30s. He was white. He had dark, dirty hair. Ooh. I guess it looked greasy or something. Yeah, I've seen some bugs in his hair. Brushy eyebrows. <laughs> he had a mustache. Them do get a brush. They saw him in the area. They said he was driving maybe a rusty gray or faded blue Buick. And it was seen somewhere near this compound, witnesses so, would later say. He's dirty blonde hair guy with the rusty gray Buick. I guess. What the hell? He sounds totally gnarly. Over the years, law enforcement had hoped that DNA technology would help aid in the case. So far, they have ruled out 23 suspects because, again, they talked to the stripter, they talked to the salvage crew, you know, they've talked to the nuns, the caretaker, but they've made no arrests in this case. That's crazy. So it remains unsolved. Well, I mean, we talk about a lot of, you know, true crime and murders. They're each vicious and brutal and horrible in their own way but who would kill a nun yeah i mean i'm not particular. you know i'm not is it, i'm not religious well, we're not but i still religious. would i'm i'm a, it's just like but even I respect, if you're not catholic like this the nun like transcends all that stuff like as a symbol of right. caretaking and resolution well they're just, essentially you know married to god and they're yeah. they're like an extension of and they dedicate them live their whole life to that i mean they're an extension of this, you know, right? I don't know, deity yeah. or whatever. I don't you know, know either. This religion, but yeah. So it's just oh, to, it's like to killing a, kill a nun, a priest with the call, you know, the white collar on. Like, even if I was a super badass dude, even super badass dudes don't want to kill a priest or a nun. You know what I mean? Well, Maybe it just it's just symbolic. Makes it more fucked up. Yeah, in some way. It seems for me, way. for someone that clean. Right. Living. She's a nun. She's out of this compound. You know that it's a retreat for nuns. They've done nothing but help people. I yeah. mean, and, and to just find her and she's obviously praying, meditating, and you just walk up and grab her and... That's insane. Rape and kill a nun. That just takes, I think, an extra special kind of... Well, maybe karma got that person. Brutal person. Even though it's unsolved. Uh, maybe karma really served it up to that piece of shit. Yeah, it's definitely one of the, like, top unsolved cases in West Virginia. I guess so. Probably one of the most famous, you know, And it was cases. right during the middle of the day. Yeah. Right in, there, in a football the... length, field length from the main houses. Right. So that's... And, you know, no witnesses. But that goes to show you 300 foot in the country is quite a bit different than 300 foot in the city. Am it's I true. right? yeah. Could have knolls and ridges or, or anything. Trees, a thicket. Yeah. As we call it around here, you know, wild roses up above your head for 50 feet. A brush, a blind. Yeah, that can that really, can't... that can really throw sound down. It's true. Because of all the, you know, yeah. Well, those were two of the unsolved cases in West Virginia. You... Just thought we would touch on those and uh, tell you about them. The more we dig around in West Virginia, it seems like a really cool place. A little cool state was a really a lot of history. I've heard it's beautiful. A lot of old history from the very beginning, just like every other state in this area well it is wild and wonderful yeah but um yeah (laughs) i've been through some parts of west virginia i've been through harper's ferry yeah i've been up through like martinsville 
Yeah, I'd like to go up through there. Just kind of the area that's outside or closest to Washington, D.C., because I've driven up to, like, Philadelphia and up to Pennsylvania. Oh, now she's so, just name-dropping. So I've driven through parts of West Virginia. Okay. Um, Kind of in and around the D.C. area when I lived there. You know, I've seen some of it, and probably not the pretty part. Because it wasn't like I was in a area with like a lot of mountains and right, like you the whole country. Is there a mount? Yeah, right. Where the Appalachians actually run through West Virginia. Yeah. Okay. So I've not been to that part, but I've been. So you're on the flat West Virginia. Yeah, it was kind of flat. Oh, was that like flat Kentucky? I kinda. love Kentucky. There's a lot of horses. Well, I'll say it's I so felt flat. I felt, and I'm not making fun because trust me, where we're from is is not like some great place, but. Yeah. I, I was with my cousin, and we were Smart. driving up to Philadelphia. I was actually driving up there because my son was at summer camp right, for like a week, and I had to go pick him up. So we drove up to pick Zane up, and we get, you know, we get, we're seeing signs like West Virginia, whatever, and, and my cousin's like, oh, you know, I've never been here, so he's kind of excited. So we cross the state lines, and there's the big sign that's like, welcome to like wild and wonderful West Virginia. Oh, yeah. And then immediately past that was like these two trailers, like single wides trailers that were, God, probably from the 60s. No. Those like super old school ones. Yeah. You know the one I'm talking about? Like the rounded ends and Yeah, and like, like that. the windows that like yeah. you had to crank. Oh, yeah. And there were like seven or eight of those yeah, little like, glass panels yeah. that come and out. And no air comes to those. No, and they were like faded, faded, like mint green yeah, and, and yellow. Yeah, and mustard yellow. And yes. And white, but it's not white anymore. I mean, they were just right, like... Right, I know exactly what you're talking these about. These old... Well, I know because I'm like, hell, I, I you know, I, I grew, grew up knowing people who lived in them trailers, yeah, but... <laughs> that was that was Jim down in Lot B. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, so we cross in, we see this big sign. And, and then these And then trailers. we see these two trailers. And then just past the two gnarly trailers was like this big ass Confederate flag. Ah, uh, like I'm not talking like oh just a flag, but like one of them big ones, right? Like the hundred by hundred, laughing in the wind. Yeah, and my cousin and I just look at each other and we start laughing, and he's like, "Well, I feel at home," <laughs> and I was like, "Well," because again, it was it's not much different from what we see around here, right? And uh, yep. it was just kind of funny because it was like everything I could imagine West Virginia would be. It was all right there in a quarter mile. Yeah, totally. Nice. <laughs> it's exactly. like if you can't handle. What you've just seen, you probably should just leave. Yeah. Leave West Virginia. <laughs> but I thought that was kind of cute because it's like, eh, it really isn't much different from where we live. No. This no. region is, uh, it's, no. for, for as uh, much as you get away and things are different, things really are the same. Man. And we went, when we went, when we went to get Zane in Cincinnati, right. the one time we drove up through Kentucky, ended up in what was it? Pineville, Kentucky? Pikeville. Pikeville. Yeah. And that was, I was just like, this is such a cool seeming little town. I bet it was awesome to walk in, walk around in, you know, but I'm just like, where do these people work? Where does everybody work? Yeah. Because there was like literally nothing every, anywhere, not even off the main road. Like usually you have a little bit of industry or, you know, an exit with this and that on it. Nope. Nothing but sheer rock faces cut right through the weirdest sedimentary rock shit I've ever seen. They would just cut straight through whole exits off the interstate through the rocks. Well, it's much like how they butchered the roads around here. I mean, if you take I-40 and you go through the gorge, as we call it, oh. which is the I-40 section between North Carolina into Tennessee, yep, which is the like main vein. Haywood County, North Carolina, where we live yep. now, into um, like Newport, yep. Tennessee, that um, stretch of road. I mean, they have cut through a mountain. And there's rock slides constantly. They shut down the highway. I mean, it's it's chaos. not a ma- they they all they can do is they know it's going to slide. It's just when and when it does, they see how fast they can clean it up and do it again. Yeah. And that was cut through there what in the 40s or something? Yeah, probably around that. So could I mean, you imagine part that? Of the New Deal, you know, the TVA. Yeah. And, and it all was that. such big work they would never finance opening that up and doing anything major differently because could you imagine back then them cutting that through that gorge by basically hand yeah and a little bit of equipment and it's so narrow through there isn't it it's a very dangerous chunk of 40 and it's the main vein out of the south and you know into the midwest and whatnot yeah i mean i 40 the main vein cuts across the entire united states yeah you can drive 
from coast to coast on 40. Yeah, and uh, all the time, both lanes right there is shut the fuck down. <laughs> yeah, it seems like there's always some kind of rock slide in that area. But, that, yeah, that's the thing with living in Appalachia. I mean, a lot of people have their ideas of what it's like here. And, you know, we live here and a lot of our listeners live in this area. Yeah. And it can be rural. It can be cruel. <laughs> yeah, you know? but it's I mean, beautiful. It's a, 